Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, launching a data quality program with Mark Horseman. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just a note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you uh, as our speaker for today, Mark Horseman. Mark is a data management professional and CDMP practitioner with over 20 years of experience and acts as a data evangelist for Dataversity. Mark moved into data quality, master data management, and data governance early in his career and has been working extensively in data management since the early 2000s. Previous to his work at Dataversity, Mark led information management initiatives in both private and public sector organizations. And with that, I will give the floor to Mark to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, and thank you for that wonderful introduction, Shannon. And uh, today we're, we're kind of going through launching a data quality program. And uh, along with this is a, is a wonderful white paper that we had published on the Dataversity website. So uh, while it's not required that you have downloaded it before attending this webinar, um, you may find it uh, fun to play along uh, with a copy of the template that we provide in that white paper, um, as we will be discussing how that all works and how it kind of all fits together. So as we talk about launching a data quality program, uh, what we want to talk today is, is, is about that template and, and how to charter your data quality program uh, and, and get it launched without uh, uh, much trouble. So when we think about chartering a brand new data quality program, we want to talk about purpose and scope, roles and responsibilities, what a steering committee looks like, and we want to talk about uh, KPIs and OKRs, uh, return on investment, key performance indicators, and observations and key results. So I can see chat's electric already. Um, I do want to save a lot of time for questions, but uh, feel free to, to start slamming questions into the Q&A, and we can have a, a very lively discussion about uh, some of the uh, topics that we'll be raising here today. So again, I really want to highlight that the charter and, and what the white paper breaks down is, is these key components about purpose and scope, uh, like what are the goals and activities of our data quality program, uh, roles and responsibilities, I like to say who's who in the zoo, um, how do we achieve those results, what is the process that we're going to follow, and, and how are we going to do that, uh, how do we show that our program is working and achieving results, and uh, do we, how do we prove that the right people are doing the right activities at the right time? And the thing I get asked about in private and at events the most is how do we show value to the business? What is the ROI? What is operational efficiency in terms of staff time? Uh, what, is the, what is decision accuracy and risk? What does that all mean? And how do we communicate these things? <clears throat> So I, I also do want to highlight that uh, that this template and, and activities around it are uh, make up part of a, a class that I do teach called the Data Quality Bootcamp, uh, and we'll we'll share some more details on that uh, uh, later in the presentation. So when we get into chartering a data quality program, uh, we get into like purpose and scope. And so uh, there's a few fun things that I like to say here, and you, you can see our, our fun little graphic at the bottom here. Weasel words, watch for weasel words. Um, and, I, and I see this a lot when, when, when folks try to be clever. <laughs> I've fallen prey to this myself. And we kind of just name things, um, whatever we think sounds good. So maybe we want to do something for financial sustainability, for example. Well, what the heck does that even mean? So when we're defining what a program is or what it means, we have to make sure that we're using clear language. Communication ultimately is only really communication if the other side, your audience actually understands what it is you are saying. 
So when we talk about purpose and scope, we want to make sure we have some broad strokes understanding who the sponsor is for our, our program. That is the person who uh, is going to ultimately maybe put up some cash for us to, to spend on this or provide resources to spend on this. Who are the stakeholders? Uh, so who has uh, some ultimate benefit in seeing a program like this succeed? Um, who are the owners of the data in our organization? And we'll get into some other roles and responsibilities later. Um, ultimately, though, when we're talking about scope, we want to consider a couple of different things. Uh, what data from what systems are we covering as part of our data quality program? Now, this is a wonderful thing to have in your initial uh, a charter document because you don't want to fall into the trap of trying to deal with things uh, that are, are too broad. You don't want to boil the ocean, as, as they always say. So you want to make sure that you're including something specific and excluding something specific. We will not deal with data at the launch of this charter in, that's coming from this system. That is not in scope. Um, this is going to save you a lot of headaches as people start getting excited and want you to start tackling uh, different, what we call critical data elements, uh, CDEs, you'll see them. And that is uh, a data element that is uh, critical to the operation and decision-making uh, functions of your organization. Uh, so the other aspect that you want to consider when building your charter, uh, building your, your scoping document, is where does the data reside? Uh, wh where is this hitting people and, and what do we want to capture? Uh, so are we looking at uh, resolving and, and profiling and doing data observability in a source system, in our data warehouse, in our reports? Uh, where are eyeballs first hitting the data? Uh, where are people in encountering uh, data quality programs? So where does data reside and where are we acting on it? I, I love in chat that somebody uh, gave me a call out for weasel words and then having pictures of beavers. And that is because I, sir, am Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll uh, skip to the, the next slide here. So when we talk about roles and responsibilities, uh, my good friend, Bob Siner, likes to say everyone's a data steward, get over it. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, everybody at, at the bottom um, and, and how that role works here. Uh, but these are the kinds of roles I like to consider when launching a data quality program. And it's important to have some of this called out right in that charter document. Because ultimately, you're going to have these roles be forever present whenever you start dealing with data quality uh, issues. And, and I use the word program very specifically. And if there's uh, some PMI folks in the audience, that's the Project Management Institute folks in the audience. Um, it might not be the exact definition of, the, of a program, but what I mean is, is the trappings of, of a data quality initiative where you can spin up little data quality projects, um, but the program is the ultimate container for those. Uh, so when we talk about a program, that program itself has a sponsor. So in my experience, um, this is typically the executive who is directly championing, supporting, providing resources to your program. So uh, they're your, your best friend in, when it comes to, to getting resources. Not only are they, um, if, if you're uh, so lucky to uh, earn uh, the funding to get a tool, um, this is the person who would provide that, but you're also looking at somebody who can identify resources and, and help you connect a data quality program to business value. Now, the data quality program manager, that is typically us. Uh, so when, when we're the ones putting together that data quality program charter, the person who is operating and doing the care and feeding of that program <clears throat> is, is typically uh, us. Uh, so that is the, the data quality program manager role. Now, one thing, like if you take away any key learning from from this presentation and i've often said this um 
uh, at many places that I've done data quality is the person running the data quality program, the data quality program manager fixes no data quality. They provide the tools, resources, formalization, process around and monitoring around data quality, but they are not responsible for actually fixing quality themselves. They're not the person who is going to log into a system and fix a row or column. They're not the person who is going to run a script to, to, to fix a whole bunch of things. They're not the person who is going to implement a preventative measure. Uh, they're the person who is going to provide the coordination for all of those activities, but they are not going to be the person who actually does the work in the end. Now, th this is a bit of a uh, a bone of contention um, among folks. And often when I talk about data quality, I hear the refrain that uh, uh, I've got data in my title and therefore um, it is expected of me at my organization that I am responsible for all data quality <clears throat> and, and, and I have to fix it. My, my answer to that, if, if that is the, the culture at your organization is in your role as data quality program manager or whatever that, that title happens to be, um, what skin in the game do you have for that data being correct? You're not the person making a phone call. You're not to a, to a customer. You're not the person making a decision about what products to sell. You're not the person making the decision about what retail location to close. So, there is no skin in the game for the data quality program manager to be connected to what it means or what it feels or the tangible effects of having good data. That is not the program manager role. Now, when we get into some of these other roles, you'll start to see that that, that is illuminated a little bit. And we talk about data owners. So this is an important role to, uh, to have in your program. And, and in this sense, and I've heard data owner be uh, described or labeled uh, a number of different things. <clears throat> so ultimately, what I mean by data owner is the person at an organization that ultimately has the accountability for the validity of that data or the accuracy of that data in the organization. They are the person usually who is uh, the the project sponsor for implementing a, an ERP system, a, an enterprise resource planning system. Or they, they would be like the director of HR um, when you consider uh, an HRM system, uh, a human resource management system, uh, or human capital management, HCM system. I think that's the one of the acronyms used for that sort of thing. Uh, but ultimately, we're talking about somebody who has accountability in the organization for something being correct. Now, <clears throat> when we say data stewards, a data steward is often recognized by a data owner, uh, typically a, a team lead type person, uh, somebody who is in charge with, uh, of, of, a, of, of a team of folks uh, who have key knowledge on the data or processes in question. Uh, so... In, in this sense, you might have a, a team lead level person, a middle manager level person uh, who has a, a team of, of data entry folks or, or analysts or what have you underneath them that uh, interact with these systems on a daily basis and are responsible for entering data into, into the system. So when we talk about data stewards, they're basically the, the managers of what I like to call data custodians. So these are the folks who have intimate knowledge of following processes that lead to the creation of data in your organization. So when I start thinking about data quality and understanding a data quality issue and who's involved, I understand that a data owner is ultimately responsible for that data at an organization. A data steward is ultimately responsible for the team that works on that data. And that team is made up of custodians. Um, and when we get into the world of fixing these things, the, the owner has to sign off on the fact that there's enough business impact there uh, for something to be worked on. 
uh, the stewards know the exact custodians who are able to help and understand this issue. The steward, uh, if there's a need to change a process, might have some uh, good knowledge about what needs to change with the process and how that process can be improved. And then the custodians typically are the types of folks who can make that happen. Uh, whether they're the ones who can log into a system and fix data quality errors uh, or understand how a process can be improved that would prevent data quality errors from happening in the first place. Uh, we like to talk about audit. Um, I like to, to leave a little bit of space to, to put in audit controls. And, and here I want to, to, to highlight um, auditors as, as folks who are proving that processes and procedures are followed. So um, if, if some of you out there in chat are familiar with like Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, you have separation of duties um, and being able to prove that only certain people have access to certain things and only certain people um, um, are able to carry out a role as assigned. Uh, so I do like to highlight that and document that within the context of a program as well. Um, <clears throat> and, I, 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 and again, as I said at the beginning of this slide, I, I like Bob Signer's, everyone is a data steward. Everyone has a relationship to data. What I mean in the context of setting up a data quality program is you're going to have a concept of members at large uh, out in your organization. You are going to have people who are impacted by the quality of data, whether it stays quote unquote bad <laughs> or um, if it gets improved, uh, that they'll be able to do their job better. One of the examples I like in this is, is consider sales folks. Um, if, if you've got bad contact information for customers in your database and your sales folks can't uh, reach out to, to people, if you start working on improving that and your sales folks are able to successfully connect with more customers and therefore successfully move people through a sales funnel at a higher rate, uh, then your salespeople are going to be happy. They're, they're not necessarily going to be uh, a custodian or an owner or a steward, but they have a, a vested interest in, in the improvement of data quality. So it's nice to have folks like this uh, documented, especially uh, when it comes to proving the value of your system. Uh, these are people who are going to be champions of the program and their status as a champion of your data quality program is really because it's created a, a positive impact on their work life. Uh, it's created a positive impact on, on their performance uh, at an organization or whatever it is that they do. I, I remember uh, one story in, in my past uh, where um, <laughs> there was one employee at, a, at an organization I worked at uh, that uh, used to spend months, or uh, not months, sorry, they used to spend weeks uh, cleaning up data for a monthly report. So they had this monthly report that they had to produce, and every month they'd almost spend two weeks cleaning up data to produce this report. And we looked at that and said, well, there's a lot we can do here. There's a lot of preventative actions we could do here. And we managed to take that two weeks and shrink it down uh, to just a couple of days um, and not have this never ending sea of data quality fixes that this person had to, to manage. And, um, and they came to me after we, we implemented a bunch of data quality fixes. And they said, you know what, Mark, this is the first time since I've started working here, that I've been able to take a meaningful vacation. Uh, so th there can be a lot of uh, wonderful impacts to, to getting this stuff right. Oh, now I get to talk about the steering committee. <clears throat> so uh, this is something I like to spend a lot of time on when I when I teach this class, um, uh, the class that this uh, this template comes from, but ultimately steering committees drive what data you work with as as part of your data quality program. They provide you that recognition of what are the critical data elements that are high priority right now. What are the decisions we're trying to make as a business? Where are we being crushed? 
Um, this is where you get to make friends with your executives. And, and if, if you do anything as part of a data quality program or even a data governance program, making friends with executives is a, is a, is a good idea. <laughs> They're the ones who give you resources and money. Uh, uh, generally, your stakeholder roles are those, those higher level folks. Um, uh, they'll give you a sense of where data quality aligns to business strategy, and they'll help you connect those dots. Ultimately, as a data quality program manager, it's your job to evangelize that uh, continually at your organization. And then on a steering committee too, you do want those members at large that I had mentioned. Uh, so like, like the salesperson example that I had, a steering committee meeting, um, you don't have to meet, like sometimes I've seen steering committees or it's like, oh yeah, we got to get the steering committee together twice a month or monthly. Really a steering committee should just be, hey, are we on track? This is what we're doing. Here's a progress report. Um, typically I've been running steering committees like once a quarter, um, at some organizations I've done them twice a year. Some organizations I've done them once a year. Uh, sometimes I've, I've done them as little as a email touch base. Hey, this is our update. Do you have any questions? Um, I find that that's not as effective. Um, usually it doesn't keep engagement up as much. So I do like that personal, um, uh, uh get together that that personal touch base with with a steering committee um, when you set up a steering committee and it's important to document who is in your steering committee as part of your your data governance program charter and or sorry data quality program charter and you'll see that in the template uh, but you do want to have a sense of what are the responsibilities of those steering committee members uh, what is the standing agenda going to look like um, uh, what can we expect out of a meeting? What's actionable? And then what are the progress reports that people are going to get? And, and when we talk about progress reports, that's really going to tie into the OKRs and KPIs, uh, that's observations and key results and, uh, uh, key performance indicators of our data quality program. Uh, usually that, that forms that, uh, uh, that progress report. Now, I have in the past built templates for these sorts of things as well. So like a term sort of reference for a steering committee. I do have a couple uh, <laughs> of those templates kicking around on my laptop somewhere. But I do find that for a terms of reference, there's a lot of cultural uh, factors uh, that form around uh, what is appropriate for a steering committee uh, meeting or a steering committee uh, set of commitments. Uh, for folks at an organization, it can vary quite a bit. Um, and I've seen it vary quite a bit at even public sector institutions, whether that's higher ed or government. Um, it, you can have a lot of uh, change in, in what people are, will respond to and uh, the kinds of availability that you'll get, out, get from folks. Now, because we're dealing a lot with higher level executives, um, there, there's one piece of information that is that is always held true uh, when I've set these up is that uh, those folks are typically time constrained. Uh, so you'll, you'll, you'll be challenged to get time on a calendar, uh, but that's where having that, those terms of reference, uh, having conversations with folks and say, hey, if you can't make the committee meeting, we need a delegate. Um, so you need to be able to send a delegate and let me know who that is and that sort of thing. And But having that that continual cadence, like it's the first Monday of every quarter or the last Thursday of every quarter, or it's uh, July 1st and January 1 or whatever uh, the timing works out to be, uh, just have some consistency to that too, um, because it makes it easier for people to manage their calendars ultimately. All right. So when we talk about showing and describing return on investment. This is one of the, the biggest challenge areas I, I see when talking to people about uh, data quality and, 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 and how to get engagement. Um, so I like to talk a little bit about operational efficiency as, a, as an area that can improve, like as a, as a return on investment area. And when we talk about ROI, anything that you can do for ROI uh, that you can document in a program charter 
is great, even if they're just examples uh, to document in a, in a in a program charter. But you do kind of want to be specific about a few things. Uh, so I've seen a lot of folks uh, talk about time to detection and time to resolution. So uh, these are a couple of, of fairly basic things that we can think about with operational efficiency. How long did it take us to notice that there was a problem that stopped us from working uh, with our critical data? And how long does it take to resolve or work around issues with that critical data? So these are things, uh, if we prevented data quality errors from happening in the first place, um, these are things that save us a significant amount of time. Uh, and then we like to consider downtime cost. Um, so this is kind of touch and go because it depends on, on the impact of your quality issue. If we're talking about the accuracy of customer information, then it's... Uh, it's not that your system's going to go down because your customer has an incorrect email address. Um, but there are data quality issues that can cause systems to, to be down or, or a process to fail. Um, so we like to consider the amount of time uh, spent as a result of quality issues. Uh, a good example of that, again, would be the story I told earlier about the one person who spent weeks and weeks um, cleaning up data for a monthly report. Uh, there's a, a significant monetary impact to resolving those quality issues that are a benefit to the organization. The, the thing that you're going to generally get the most bang for your buck with when, when earning the, the championship of executives is uh, talking about decision accuracy and, uh, and risk. So being a, an agent of risk reduction will make you a popular person. <laughs> at your organization. Um, and boy, howdy, do I have many, many stories about this. So if you, if you ever get a chance to come to a, a conference uh, that I'm at, and, and uh, we've got uh, DGIQ, AI governance, and uh, women in data management um, uh, coming up right away, um, come and see me. And I've, oh, I've got stories <laughs> about decision risk. Um, but ultimately, executives like to have confidence that they're making the right decision at the right time uh, and and having that that trust in the data uh, i've i've gone to so many organizations um where i've come in and said like why like why is data quality uh top of mind right now it's like I, i'm looking at our reports and i can't i can't trust the data i don't know in my heart if I'm making the right decision and we're forced into having to close a retail uh, 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 establishment. We're, we're forced to close a brick and mortar store and I don't know if I'm closing the right brick and mortar store. Like those are, are, are challenging decisions. And if you can reduce risk, if you are an agent of risk reduction in those types of decisions, uh, your executives are going to love you. So being able to document some of these things right in your, uh, right in your data quality program charter uh, will be a boon to, to getting things done. So uh, I, I do like to, to get into some specifics, KPRs and o KPIs and OKRs. If you say them both really fast, you can uh, mess, mess that up really good. <laughs> so I, I, this is where I like to talk about weasel words again. Uh, avoid weasel words, uh, especially when we're talking about KPIs and OKRs. You don't want people to invent in their head what something means. Uh, so when we're giving a progress report on our data quality program, um, what are the total numbers of rows fixed this quarter? Uh, a real easy to understand uh, kind of a concept. Now, an example weasel word name that I got caught using once a long time ago before I knew better was this is our data quality improvement score. Nobody knows what that means. There's no intrinsic knowledge of what a data quality improvement number score means. We want uh, uh, something that's clean and clear, um, being able to show that we've fixed so many rows in a quarter um, is, is a wonderful way to show progress. And it's a basic measure that people can just intrinsically understand. Um, how much revenue have we saved? Uh, <laughs> uh, so program value is, an, again, like a, a, a weasel word that you might hear. 
uh, you're not really saying anything by calling something program value. What does that mean? Program value measured in dollars? That's nice. Uh, but if we talk about estimated revenue saved, then we know if we fixed an error uh, or we fixed S X errors, uh, we can show the value of, of a particular effort. Um, a fantastic example of this is something that I've uh, uh, done in the past. And I've used this example if you've come to um, events that I've done before. Um, I used to work in higher ed. So one institution that I worked at, I heard the lovely thing. And, and if you ever hear this, yeah, um, uh, this is my golden rule of data quality. When somebody tells you that their data quality is perfect, they have the worst data quality. <laughs> this seems to be like a golden rule of anything that I've ever done. You're like, our data quality is perfect. Your data quality is terrible. <laughs> as soon as you start digging into it. Uh, there was one organization I worked with and it's like, we know exactly where you live because we have a wire going to your house to provide internet. And I'm like, for five years, you've been sending me a bill for the previous resident. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not an accurate statement. <laughs> um, but one thing I did in, in higher ed, working with a, an alumni organization, um, and, and alumni in higher education, uh, typically the, the business model there is we want to engage with people who achieved a, a degree at our organization, attended a convocation ceremony. Uh, we want to solicit them for donations. So there's, uh, there's a connection to the school. There's pride in, in where you uh, got your education, um, where you achieved your qualification. We want to uh, give people the opportunity to give back to their, their home school. So um, uh, donation campaigns are, are frequent in that sort of a space. So when we started working on this um, and, and I heard oh, our data quality is perfect, we, we have the best data quality. Um, I, I said to folks, well, we're looking at people who just attended a convocation a ceremony, achieved a qualification like a bachelor of science or something. And uh, they're probably not going to be living in the same place within a few days. And sure enough, uh, this is where I, I started yipping about the concept of half-life of data. Half of our uh, mailing addresses were no longer valid within 30 days. So think of that half of our mailing addresses are no longer valid so uh within 30 days so there's an effort to make sure we have the right email address but if you think about that if you're sending out uh, requests for donations um let's say you do an email blast or a mail blast to send a pamphlets to folks and 20 percent of people donate so if 30 percent of your mail is returned return to sender because it's uh, not deliverable or not not accurate for that person anymore. Um, if you were to fix uh, two thirds of those email address or those addresses, two thirds of that contact information, you could expect another 20% of that, that chunk to come back as successful donations. And then you can calculate, hey, this is how much revenue we're bringing in from donations by fixing data quality problems. There's a specific dollar value that you can attach to that. Um, and, and here I like to also provide an example uh, of, a, of an OKR type of a measure. Uh, so some organizations like to, to base performance on observations, um, uh, they like to be goal focused and to see that things are working towards a goal. So. Um, a good example of this is overall customer feedback. So um, uh, customer success might be something you see uh, in higher ed. We like to call this student success, which is kind of a silly thing when we really mean convocation. <laughs> a student has achieved a degree. Um, <clears throat> convocation is not a, a verb, by the way. It's a noun. Uh, so, <laughs> this is a little, little higher ed trivia for you. Uh, so when we talk about OKRs, we, we really want to see a, an observation that, hey, you know, we're improving some quality here so we can better um, meet the needs of our customers. 
uh, we can better understand that our customers are getting the service that they need and uh, are, as a result, happier and more likely to engage in, in more activities with us. Uh, so this is, is something that, that you need to be aware of. Now, um, I've talked a little bit about weasel words in this context. Uh, what I also like to consider here is when we're looking at observations, this is a use all five senses type thing. Uh, what is it? What does it look like when we achieve success? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like? Like, what does it sound like when we have success? And, and that may sound silly, but even in the context of higher education, um, we would, uh, um, <laughs> meet me and a bunch of the, the data nerds at one organization, um, started to correlate the uh, the smell of the deep fryers in the cafeteria with final exam grades. If students were more anxious or or uh, uh, nervous about an exam, uh, both pre and post, the the amount of deep fried food ordered in the cafeteria would go up. So if uh, if the deep fryers were working overtime, we could actually correlate that to uh, a, an effect in in student grades, which was which was fascinating. But these are are examples of how to build measures. Ultimately, we want to build a measure that is tied directly to a business goal um, that is going to resonate with our steering committee. Uh, we want to make sure that that is defined as part of our program charter, uh, so that uh, that people can. Um, uh, really see and feel the value and appreciate the value of a data quality program. So with that, um, I, I do see that there are a gajillion questions and chat was so electric that I completely lost track of what was going on in chat because I've got it on teeny weeny eye strain o vision right in front of my face. Uh, but I would absolutely love to meet up with folks uh, at our upcoming conference. So. Uh, from December 9th to 13th in the wonderful Washington, D.C. at the Omni Shoreham Hotel. Uh, we are running the Data Governance and Information Quality Conference alongside with the AI Governance Conference and the Women in Data Management and Governance event at, uh, at that uh, event as well. So um, we have a special coupon code that you can use. Uh, so this is for, for you folks out in, in audience land. Uh, if you want to pop in at this conference and save a cool 15% on your registration, use code MARK15. Um, so a um, couple of the sessions that I'll be doing there is I will be talking and helping folks uh, produce um, policies, procedures, and guidelines for AI governance. Uh, so yeah. That'll be a great workshop and I hope people can attend. I'll also be talking about shadow AI and I'll be doing uh, some CDMP uh, exam preparation too for, for folks who are looking uh, to write their CDMP exam while they're there. Um, the conference itself uh, focuses a lot on data quality. Uh, so that's hence the information quality moniker um, and a lot of data governance content as well. So it promises to be a wonderful event. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is a lot of this talk about how to build this charter um, is, is really one of the, uh, the key components of a class that I teach called the Data Quality Bootcamp. And uh, we do have a couple of offerings, live uh, online offerings of that class coming up next year. And for you folks out in audience land, uh, we have this wonderful Horseman 20 coupon code, which will save you a cool... 20% on that. And so uh, I, I put on my little salesy voice here, but really, ultimately, uh, we talk not just about uh, the, the, the data quality program charter and how to build that out and why it's important and as a foundational document for, for managing data quality, but we also like to talk about specific processes that you can embed into that and, and how to document those as part of your, your data quality program. Uh, we spent half a day on that, in fact. Uh, but we also talk about what critical data elements are. Uh, we also get into uh, uh, data quality dimensions. If, if folks in the audience are familiar with that, we'd like to talk about accuracy, validity, timeliness, and those sorts of things. 
Um, uh, but as as people who who know me uh, well know, I, I like to say, don't be constrained by thinking that data can only be wrong in certain ways. Data can be wrong in all sorts of ways, um, and you don't need an observ observ <laughs> observability tool to tell you how your data is wrong. Uh, you need the business to care about how your data is wrong. Um, and a critical data element in a data quality program is is only as uh, critical as somebody's care to fix it. If, if nobody cares about a data quality program, then why does your, or a data quality element or a critical data element, then why does your data quality program care about it as well? You don't want to be the person just fixing data quality for the sake of fixing data quality. Uh, so we get into to that a little bit as well. Um, and we also get into how to evaluate uh, tools and, and vendors and stuff. But uh, this coupon code will work for a, a number of uh, products on the training.dataversity.net site. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, and I left a bunch of time for questions. Shannon, do you want to uh, uh, hit me with your best shot, as I think Pat Benatar <laughs> would say? <laughs> I love it. I love your passion for data quality there. Um, so just to uh, answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session along with anything else. I put the um, link to the template in there uh, a bit ago in the chat. So if you scroll up, you can be able to find that. So I am in here, Mark, lots of questions coming in. Um, how do you measure data quality? Yeah, and I've done this a number of ways. And um, one of the things that I've had the most success with, um, there's a couple of things I've done recently. Uh, one was super fun. One has always been uh, well-received. And and uh, we do get into this in, in my class a bit, but I, I invented something uh, a number of years ago that I like to call the data quality golf card. Uh, so what the, the concept of this is, is based on uh, Kimball screens, uh, so a Kimball screen is, think of it as like panning for gold, uh, not so much as a, as a computer screen, is uh, shaking that, that, that sieve and having your, your, your good data stay in and your bad data fall out and understand that bad data. Now, Kimball puts uh, a value uh, to each error. Uh, so uh, he, he puts a value of between zero and one on there. And so um, adding up and aggregating that value yields you a score. Now, when working with data quality and working with data stewards, I would often discover that there were a number of errors that uh, uh, wouldn't just wouldn't be fixed, or there was no desire to fix, or there was a acceptable threshold uh, for for data to be incorrect. And and that just made sense. Uh, ultimately, I didn't want to send out notifications or activate data stewards or data custodians to fix data quality programs or data quality problems. Sorry, if if it wasn't uh, um, uh, above that threshold. So that threshold became a par score and uh, they would get a golf card whenever their score was over par. And I would give them the ability to find the rows that were bad. So that's one way uh, of, of doing it. And, and I liked that because specific stewards and custodians would get errors, uh, get notifications around specific critical data elements that they cared about and had a connection to. So there, it built, it fostered a lot of engagement. Uh, so that worked really well. Uh, another thing that I've done is uh, giving letter grades to uh, 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 reports uh, themselves and measures that are on reports. And so if there's a key performance indicator for an organization, um, if it's made up of a bunch of composite parts and we're doing some data quality on those, um, I can understand by running data quality checks, the number of rows that are good or bad, and then aggregate that score together to produce a letter grade. Uh, so that's something that I talk about in, in, in the class as well. Uh, most recently, um, that is something that I've worked on. And, and you'll see that kind of activity supported in a lot of uh, vendor tools these days as well, uh, which is really interesting. So you can say this, the data quality for, for this KPI or this measure or this field on this report is green or A plus or gold star or what have you. You'll see all those sorts of things in tools these days. So those are tangible, visible, um, interactable things um, that can be provided to end users so that they know the, the quality they're working at is either monitored and not so great 
or they can have some trust in it that it is good. Thank you. And Mark, you know, you mentioned, you know, getting uh, the business to care about data quality, but, mm -hmm. and what would you um, say are your next best steps if leadership does not express interest in data quality? How do you even get your foot in the door? <laughs> this is, this is, this is where, where my opinion is a bit controversial. If the business doesn't care, then congratulations, neither do you. <laughs> uh, which is a, a bit of a cheeky way to say that. Uh, but ultimately, like I said early on in the presentation, as a data quality program manager, you're not responsible for fixing data quality. And if the business isn't going to provide you resources to improve data quality, um, then then there's no direct connection there. There's no culture for improvement. So um, you, you either have uh, a data quality initiative tied to a business a, a critical data element, or you don't. Um, and if you don't, then then why are you there? So it's a bit cheeky for me to say it like that. Um, a, a, an example of success that I've had recently is uh, at working at an organization that had its funding cut. Um, there was a, a, a push for what they called financial sustainability. How do we teach students and, and make sure that our institution can remain afloat? Um, so what are things that we can change? And, and this was in an era where there was a tuition freeze in place. So we can't just increase tuition and increase revenue. What are our other options? And then we start looking at faculty workload. We start, uh, which is how many courses a, a faculty member can teach reasonably. Class sizes. We start looking at uh, international students versus domestic students and, and all of these sorts of things. So we start to build these measures. Well, the very nature of the business being able to operate is contingent on those those measures is contingent on the decisions that we make when we talk about the ratio of international versus domestic students or how many classes a, an instructor can teach and so the business has this natural care uh, for the quality of data around that even if they don't know it what we did at the time and this is where i started using uh, like a like a stamping process where something is gold stamped, something is silver stamped, something is bronze stamped. So we just started doing some documentation and uh, uh, some friends of ours, uh, Shannon, Kelly O'Neill at uh, First San Francisco Partners taught me this as uh, governance at the point of usage. But we made these grades, uh, something that showed up on a report that was a clickable artifact that people could dig into. Well, we just put them on the reports. We didn't really say what they were. Um, but people started noticing why this report is bronze, this report is silver, this report is gold. And people started clicking on them and somebody clicked on a silver report and said, oh, there's no central data quality for this report, which is why it's only silver. I want, an executive said this to me, I want all of our reports to be gold stamped reports. And at that point I knew I had the engagement I needed to, to do what I wanted with data quality. So it can be a, a, uh, an adventure, <laughs> but uh, really, yeah. if they're not engaged, then, then you don't have to do anything because they're not expecting anything anyway. And if they are expecting something, then they're naturally engaged. Perfect. So Mark, how do you answer the question of, how good is the quality of our data? Without assessing all of the data, it is difficult to know the overall quality. We know mm -hmm. if there are certain issues with data that has been assessed, but that is hard to put into a score of overall quality until all the data has been assessed, which takes a lot of time. Yeah, and this is why we like to talk about critical data elements, because ultimately, and again, uh, why does the business care about uh, something? So. Uh, you're not going to be able to move the needle on quality unless there's some connection to a business initiative or an important measure or an important activity, which is why we like to talk about critical data elements. A lot of uh, solutions out there will be like, we need to profile everything. We need to put our observabil observability tool observability tool on, on this data and, and just profile the heck out of it. And then we need to measure all of these dimensions and we need to fix everything. Well, there's no real connection to what that data is being used for in the business there. And so it's real easy to boil the ocean. It's real easy to do too much. 
uh, ultimately, when we talk about data quality, uh, you'll see this all over the place. Is the data fit for purpose? Well, the, that's a little bit trite, but and you'll see that all over the place. Ultimately, it's true, though. Uh, uh, we're trying to do this with data. Is it good enough quality uh, to do that? And when you start documenting those critical data elements, you can start documenting the things about those elements that can go wrong, that can impact business decisions. Uh, in some cases, it may not matter if something is complete or not, if something is null or not. Uh, maybe it does. Uh, uh, it does the, is, is the customer's birth date accurate? Uh, maybe that does matter. Maybe it doesn't. It depends what you're doing with that data. So when you start looking at individual critical data elements, it's real easy to kind of understand uh, what the ways that it can be wrong that are impactful to the business and to start building from there. And if once you understand that, you can quantify how many of your rows are are meeting that 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 demand, meeting that threshold, or are failing. And then it's then you suddenly get to a letter grade. Uh, seventy nine percent of our records pass our tests. So our data is seventy nine percent good for this field. Um, and if you've got multiple fields in a measure, then you can aggregate that all together. So it, it's doable, um, but it's real easy to do too much and go too far. Uh, maybe nobody cares about if something is empty or not. You really kind of have to look at, does it matter? Does it matter to the organization? Not just does it matter for the sake of doing data quality. Thank you. We've got lots of questions coming in. We'll try and get to as many as possible here in the last nine minutes of the webinar. Mark, so what is the importance of data quality tools in implementing a data quality program? Can it be started without having a tool at the very beginning? Yeah, I, actually, I, I we talk about that in, in, in the class that I do a bit too. I do recommend that all of this is put together and and run without a tool at first, because how do you know what you need and what uh, what you want a tool to do until you're actually doing something. Uh, so you can start small and, and prove it out. Uh, and you don't want uh, something like a program charter or a project to be beholden to how a tool is going to run something. You want a tool that fits how you're going to run data quality. So if, if it's absolutely critical that you have a specific tool do uh, some of those profiling checks, uh, then you need to understand that. And doing some of that by hand isn't going to be the end of the world for a single cri critical data element. Maybe you just start with one critical data element. Maybe that's customer email. Uh, maybe your your tests are, is it filled in or not, even though we're supposed to have it? Uh, maybe one of your tests is uniqueness. How many times did uh, do we see no email at noemail.com filled in by a clerk? Uh, maybe there's a process thing there to fix. And then, then you can start to understand some of the data quality uh, uh, things that you want to operate on. And then you can start to meaningfully evaluate a tool if it's going to be a good fit for what you need to get out of your data quality program and how you want to operate it. So I do recommend a low fidelity uh, solution um, and and kind of prove out your program and then start hunting for a tool. The other benefit to, to that kind of approach is you can understand how much manual effort it took to implement a data quality prevention or a data quality fix. And you can show how much ROI you're going to have by having a tool in place, by being able to upscale your program and do less work and achieve more. Uh, so it, it really becomes much clearer uh, what a tool is going to save your organization in terms of cost and, and real easy to sell ROI. And in my history, I've been able to uh, ask and get uh, funding for tools without much difficulty because I've made that argument in that way. Here, we're, we're gonna save five staff FTE. You'd be foolish not to buy this. Here's the proof. And, and people generally go for that. Makes complete sense. Thank you so much. And can you clarify, Mark, the relationship between data quality and data governance? In which way are they related and in which way they are different? There's only six minutes left. I think <laughs> I'm just going to warn you because I know we could do a whole webinar on yeah. this. Yeah. 
Exactly. And and that's a whole module in my class as well. <laughs> so I think I think in the in the class I spent a good hour and a half on that, just talking about different data governance programs. Um, our our friend uh, Gwen Thomas taught me that a data governance program can have a focus area. And one of those focus areas uh, is is often data quality. Um, so as as you kind of saw when looking at our data governance or data quality program template, we're talking about roles and responsibilities across an organization. We talk a little bit about data stewards, data owners, data custodians, those kinds of of roles and 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 understandings of of people's relationship to data. A lot of that is driven by a working data governance program. Now. Uh, well, it's ideal to have a data governance program in place before you start working on data quality. It's not necessarily required. You'll just find yourself doing a whole bunch of data governance work as part of getting your data quality program off the ground in identifying who those stewards are, who those sponsors are, who those uh, 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 custodians are, uh, who's relying on data, who's using data in your organization. Um, uh, Bob Siner uh, has the the common data matrix that sucks uh, assesses this out. So he um, <laughs> he'll identify for a, for a particular data element. You know who is the who who produces this, who uses this, who is responsible for this definition, who produces, uses, defines this data, and where does it live in in the organization? What reports does it show up on? Where what source systems does it come from? So there's all of this stuff that a data governance program does that your data quality program will benefit from. Uh, but they're, they're very uh, distinct elements. They just happen to, to work very well together. Oh, no way to do it. Love it. Great answer. So Mark, um, we don't have data owners as we have multiple business areas who can update the same data. In this case, would you have multiple data owners and need consensus from them all? Yes. Um, and you'll actually run into this if you're uh, doing data quality in the context of a master data management uh, initiative. Um, so um, if you've got customer data coming in from multiple silos, say you're a multi-pronged organization that maybe has an insurance company, has a bank, uh, has a travel agency. Like if you, if you provide multiple different services to, to customers, uh, then you'll generally have multiple um, uh, enterprise systems that is capturing that information, maybe completely different lines of business uh, that don't necessarily talk to each other. Uh, what you'll see in, in those situations is like a committee-like structure. You'll have a, a like a, a customer data committee. Um, again, uh, really, that's a collection of owners, um, and and that activity is, is it's just a little bit different. Uh, than than a standard data quality thing. Actually, I every once in a while I talk about uh, master data management and and how to build that committee and run that committee is as a as a whole module in 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 that kind of a course as well. Uh, but yeah, that's ultimately the solution. There is recognizing that there are multiple owners with multiple stakes, and and there's going to be a hierarchy of who wins and survivorship rules and. And how to identify if two customers are the same customer, all that sort of stuff. And there's a lot of quality tie-ins to that kind of work. Thank you. We've got just under three minutes here. I'm going to try to slip in another question. So, Mark, what's your stance of proactive data quality processes? For example, programs that run on a weekly, daily, daily, et cetera, basis that look for quality issues based on defined rules that are informed from previous data quality issues discovered? Yeah, wonderful. I, that, I love that question so much. Uh, this is actually something that I, I talk a bit about in class. Um, and I like that as well, because if you can take advantage of something that you've done to improve the quality of data um, um, just out of the box or, or reuse existing things, that's, that's wonderful. One thing I like to talk about too, and, uh, uh, one of our friends uh, um, uh, elucidated me on this a, a while ago, and, and I've, I've, it's stuck with me, is uh, prevention is just worth so much more than somebody fixing data. So if you can prevent bad data from happening, and as you get into the process of working with data quality, uh, one of the things that you'll do is root cause analysis. Why is the data bad? You'll probably discover that it's a process issue somewhere. You fix that process, bad data stops happening. Um, but if you can stop bad data from getting in, then you don't have entire reams of people out 
in your custodian group that are fixing data. If, if, if you don't prevent data quality problems, then you're doing nothing but creating jobs out there in user land where they're just fixing data and that's their life. And that's a horrible, horrible job life for somebody is just to fix data all day. So prevention is worth so much more um, than remediation. Perfect, Mark. That just brings us to the right to the top of the hour. Well, it's been so much fun doing a webinar with you today. Uh, thank you. And and if anybody out there uh, has some questions or wants to carry on a discussion, I believe that uh, our show notes will have my LinkedIn profile in it. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I love a good chat. So feel free to, to ask me any questions that you have. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at an upcoming event or in an upcoming class and, and we can have a good time and learn about data quality. Thank have you so much. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everybody. Yes, thank you, Mark. And uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday to everyone with links to the slides and links to the recording. And thank you all so much. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.